we're finished, if you could put together is something people can use to give to the folks and help them convert them to Christ. And it has to do with understanding the highly significant place the Lord has placed the church in when it comes to the salvation of mankind. So we continue with identifying New Testament marks in the church. And in our previous studies of the New Testament, we've noted some of those identifying marks. And they are that the Lord's church, the one you read of in the New Testament, was founded by the scriptural builder, Jesus Christ. It was founded on the scriptural foundation that Christ is the Son of God. It was founded in the scriptural place, Jerusalem, and that Christ built only one church, which was his church, Matthew 16, 18, that it is scriptural in name. In other words, the New Testament has ways of referring to it, that it has identifying terms or terms of identification, such as Church of God, Churches of Christ, the Body of Christ, the family of God. So we also see that it is scriptural in its organization. And then it has no creed but the Bible. The word of God is the final rule of faith and practice of the church. It also gives the scriptural answer to the question, as we studied last time, of what must I do to be saved. Now today we will note the following New Testament identifying mark of the church that Jesus built, Matthew 16, 18, Acts chapter 2. Namely, that it teaches one is saved by faith, but not by faith only. This necessitates in our study asking the question, what is faith? as it relates to one's faith in God or Christ or the Bible as the Word of God. What is it? It needs to be understood that, first of all, belief is the verb form of what faith is. Faith is a noun form. So they're used interchangeably, uh, grammatically, wherever they belong to be used or wherever they're found to be used to correctly in those terms in the Bible. But faith in you, faith in God, faith in Christ, faith in the gospel, faith your confidence, your trust in God, in Jesus Christ of Nazareth as the Son of God, in the Bible as the Word of God, in the gospel of Christ, the good news about Christ, as the power of God to save you from sin. That faith is created and it is sustained regarding something or someone, for that matter, as a result of adequate evidence and credible witnesses. Adequate evidence and credible witnesses. It is not a leap of faith whereby powers of observation, empirical knowledge, we come to know something, eyes, ears, nose, taste, touch. But it is taking in evidence, reasoning from it, and drawing a correct conclusion. That's as much knowledge as is empirical knowledge. So we have the Bible being a book of testimony given for the express purpose of creating and sustaining faith within our own minds or hearts. That's what is said in John 20 verses 30 and 31. And many other signs did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that ye might believe that Christ is the Son of God and that believing might have life through his name. So when we rightly divide the word of truth, handle it correctly to understand things, then when we come to the study of faith, then we see the Bible is full of evidence and testimony that proves that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God and that His gospel is the only way God saves people. <coughs> you have also Hebrews 11 in verse 1. Our faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In other words, things that are metaphysical, using the philosophical term, or spiritual as we do from the Bible, can't be examined by the five senses. 
No one's ever seen God. No one's ever smelled God. No one's ever tasted God, if such were possible. No one's ever touched Him. No one's ever done that. Now you say, well, they've heard God. Well, they heard what they purported to be God, but they had to have other, other evidence that said that's God speaking to you. Now, when I say here, I'm thinking of the idea of one human being dealing with empirical evidence. So, faith, belief, confidence is a substance of our belief in God, Christ, the Bible is the Word of God, but it's built upon evidence. Faith is never reaching the end of what we can observe and say, well, that's real knowledge. And then you take what many people call the leap of faith and you say, well, we'll just leap out there where there's no evidence and we'll conclude that's the case with the existence of God, the deity of Christ, the inspiration of the Bibles, even though we don't have any empirical proof to prove it. That's a false concept of faith. Nowhere is it taught like that in the Bible. But now the faith of which we're speaking, this trust and confidence in God built upon adequate evidence and credible witnesses is yielding, always yields to the will of God set out in the Word of God. It leads us to comply with His will. If you say, I have faith in God, but it doesn't lead you to have such a trust in Him that you will take Him at His Word and do His will, there's something wrong with your confidence and your trust. In Romans 10, verse 16, Paul wrote to the church in Rome saying, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, The Lord who hath believed our report. Now notice the interchanging of have not obeyed the gospel and have not all believed. And that tells us that when you find the Bible talking about Christians and saying they were believers, it doesn't mean they just affirmed the fact that Christ is the Son of God. It meant that they had believed in the sense of taking him at his word and obeying his will as it applied to them. And you see it used interchangeably by Paul here to the church at Rome, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. He's quoting from Isaiah. But Isaiah says, Lord, who hath believed our report? So the belief that saves has always been a belief that leads you to comply with the will of God. More about that later. So there were those who had not, according to Paul's statement to the church at Rome, had not obeyed. Thus they had no faith in the report of inspired men. The evidence didn't make them any difference. The witness of those inspired men didn't make them any difference. You know, when you think about the, the crucifixion of Christ, you have Christ crucified between two, two malefactors. One of them would not change. Now, both railed and mocked Christ at the beginning, but then there's a thief that did come to his senses, even in the miserable, painful, horrible condition he was in, and asked to be remembered when the Lord came to his kingdom. Why did one change, and why did one not? The evidence is out there before them. Well, that comes down to what ought to frighten you and me always, my own will. My will makes the difference. I must choose to submit my will to God's will, and it must be submitted to by my confidence, trust, and faith in God, built only on a thus saith the Lord proposition. Faith originates then in the heart, or we will say the mind, for that's what the heart of the Old Testament primarily, and even the New Testament means by uh, mind, or means by heart, it means the mind. And then we're back to Romans 10, 9, and 10. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Well, think about what we've already studied where Paul in Romans quoted Isaiah, and he said, they haven't obeyed, they haven't believed. Obviously, then Paul is saying here, Whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed means the one who has such confidence, belief, and trust in God based upon the truth of God's word, the evidence, and credible witnesses that leads them to obey Christ. And thus our Lord would say, Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? So in what should we have faith? In what, or maybe sometimes whom, uh, should we have faith? The Hebrews writer in that great chapter on the faithful of the Old Testament, none of them lived under the New Testament, but they had such great faith in God, points out in Hebrews 11:6, but without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must 
believe, must believe in God. And uh, if we don't, what are we going to do? Notice it's imperative. Faith then is built upon our confidence in the truth of God's word to properly set out the evidence that proves Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God and our Savior. So we understand that without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently, not haphazardly, but diligently seek after him. Thus Christ said to the Jews of his day during his earthly ministry in John 8, 24, Except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. So faith is essential. No one in a trying to say that you can't be saved by faith alone has ever minimized faith. It's trying to understand faith as the Bible pictures it, that it's essential, that it's necessary, that it's highly important. And if your faith is not right, then the rest of what you do is not going to be right either. So we must have faith or confidence or trust in the Bible as the very Word of God, communicating the will of God to mankind concerning mankind's salvation. That's the whole point of Paul quoting to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. In Mark 1, verse 15, we find this. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Now watch what he says. This is Jesus. Repent ye, now watch, and believe the gospel. The message of John the baptizer is the forerunner of the Christ, and Christ and his disciples during our Lord's earthly ministry was to the Jews who approached God under the authority of the law of Moses. And that's the way they live faithful to God. But the work of John and Jesus and the disciples was to get them to realize you need to repent of your violation of the law of Moses and believe the message that John and Jesus and the disciples are preaching to you, and that is that the kingdom of God is at hand. So repent ye and believe the gospel. I've seen people say, well, see, in becoming a Christian today, that repentance precedes faith, because it did here. But they don't understand that the Jews approach God under the authority of Moses. And they weren't living like Moses said. So to be prepared for the coming kingdom, they had to repent of sins under the law of Moses, believe the message of John and Jesus and the disciples, which was, it's the gospel of Christ that's going to save you. So it doesn't fit our situation today. Remember when we studied not long ago at different places in the Bible, you can say, what must I do to be saved? You get a different answer. Well, if you were a Jew living in the days of Christ's ministry, then you wouldn't be told what uh, was told the people on the day of Pentecost to be saved. You'd be told something just exactly like you read here that Jesus and the disciples told the Jews who were sinners under the law that they need to repent and get right with the law and believe the message of the gospel, which is the glad tidings of Christ concerning the kingdom. In Mark 16, 15 to 16, a very familiar passage to most, if not all of us, we see that one has a belief, and it's a belief in Christ, but alone it saves nobody. That belief is in Christ, is coupled with and. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So here again you see the belief in the gospel. Don't notice the baptism right now. Our point is belief. Those folks had to believe the gospel. Remember the verse preceding verse 16 of Mark is go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth, believeth what? believeth the gospel and is baptized shall be saved. So you had to believe the gospel as it declared the good news that the Messiah has come. He's Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He's done all that Jesus did to save man that you couldn't do for yourself. He suffered, bled, and died on the cross, was buried and raised again and ascended to heaven. You must believe that and be baptized to be saved. Sometimes we don't see all of that in that. That's exactly what he's talking about if you couple verse 15 to verse 16. 
And we must have faith then in all of the promises God and His Word has made to us. Hebrews 11 and verse 13. I wish in dealing with men that all the promises that have been made to me had been kept as God keeps His promises. You can't find a promise God ever makes to man that He does not keep it. He does keep it. And that's a thing that we need to do in emulating Him as members of the spiritual body of Christ. Let your yea be yea and your nay, nay. I get bothered greatly when you ask somebody, uh, do you believe thus and so? And they will give you an answer. Uh, I've heard this all the time years and years ago, and it was told before I ever got there. As a very young preacher going to the old Freed Hardeman College, the older preachers would stand up and quote Brother Hardeman when he was the longtime president of Freed Hardeman, and he had been dead several years when I started going over there. My wife went there and graduated from the school. But um, they would say when people, and they're always doing it, would write concerning brotherhood issues, they would write Brother Hardeman and ask him, where does Fred Hardeman stand on this point? He said, well, I can always answer you on the back of a penny postcard and still have room to say, how's your Aunt Sally? I don't have to explain everything in the world about why I believe something to tell you I believe it. If you ask me, do I believe the baptism of the Great Commission is foreign to in order to the remission or forgiveness of sins? Now, how do you think I'm going to answer that? I'm going to say yes. Now, do you want to know a whole lot more about that? Then we have Bible study. Do I believe that repentance is essential to salvation? Yes. Now, you want to know why? We'll have it. But I can answer any question like that. So when somebody's asked a question and they don't want to answer it, as I've said in debate many times, the way people deal with questions has a whole lot to do with determining their veracity of how they deal with things. Can you imagine somebody saying to J.D., are you married to Jenny? He said, well, what Jenny are you talking about? They said, well, uh, uh, let me look at her driver's license. Let me see her social security number. Let me go look. Back. Well, now think about how ridiculous that is. But people do that all the time when it comes to being able to answer what they believe about a given matter relative to serving God or what they've done. That's the reason that you've got the judicial process you have in our courts. When you get somebody that is sworn to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and they get up there and say, do you such and such, or have you this, that, and the other, or do you know this person, and you have to answer. And if you don't answer, guess what? They're going to appeal to the judge, and the judge is going to tell you, as the one who presides and controls that court, you must answer the question. Well, I'm not going to do it. Now guess what happens? You're going to be found in contempt of court. They may give you a little longer to say, well, now do you want to change on that? But if you persist in it, you're heading to the hooskow. <laughs> or you're going to be fine. Or both. Now, why do men who have no interest in learning the truth of God regarding salvation understand that about testimony? Why do they? Because it's the way things work. Are you sitting in a pew this morning? Well, I don't know how I want to answer that. And that's the way people are. People don't answer things because they know they're going to get hung up by the answer they give. And that's the way it always has been. And it always will be. When Jesus was asked, by what authority do I of these things? He simply turned to those people and said, John's baptism, was it from heaven or was it from men? Now they're in a mess. Because they didn't want to admit it was from heaven. But they didn't want to confess it was from men, which they really believed. Because the people took John as a prophet. And you know what their conclusion was? We can't tell. And you know how Jesus <laughs> took them with it? Then neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Why is that in your Bible? What did God expect you to learn from that when you read it? And how do you apply it to your life in dealing with people? The master teacher's there, furnishing us up to every good work, and we ignore it. We shouldn't. 
And when it comes to faith in God, there's evidence that that kind of thing should be practiced by faithful people and we apply the truth of God from the master teacher on how we live our lives. So we must have faith in the promises of God. Now notice what is said about those in Hebrews 11. These all died under the Old Testament. Either patriarchy or the law of Moses. They never knew the gospel. They never heard what those people did on Pentecost. They don't know what, they never knew what was in the New Testament as we do. And yet here is what is said to encourage people who are under the authority of Christ in the words of the New Testament. These all died in faith. Because their faith came by the word of God for them in their time. Not having received the promises. That's what the New Testament has. But having seen them afar off, they could get an idea as they look down through the stream of time and the light of the Old Testament and understand certain things. And they were persuaded of them. Enough evidence was there to keep them keeping on doing what they knew God wanted them to do in their time on earth. And they embraced them. God would do what he said he was going to do, even whether we understand it or not. And confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They knew they were just passing through. And while here under the word of God given to them in their given age was to be faithful to God in that word. And they trusted God to work everything else out. I don't know sometimes how we think. I, I know we all know we're going to die, but it's always something out there in the future. Because none of us have experienced death. Even if we've had a close call with it, no one has experienced it. Do you worry about that? Do you take thought about it? And when you can't do a thing in the world about it, you're going to die, folks. <laughs> I don't know when. And, and you might as well giggle with me because you don't know when. It's a fact. It's going to happen. Now, if you're faithful to God, built upon the thus saith the Lord proposition, and all that you do every day, trusting in the grace of God and the mercy of God to those who love Him and keep His commandments, why should that concern you? Can God take care of you? But well, if he can't, we're all lost. We have no hope if God can't take care of us. But he can. And these who had not anywhere near what we have in the New Testament in the way of knowledge of godliness, they all had enough and it kept them keeping on and knew God would take care of them. Well, now, how is this faith acquired? Well, many deceived people contend that faith comes as a result of some sort of direct operation, a miraculous operation, setting aside natural ways people come to learn anything. And it all works on the heart and all that kind of thing. But here's the thing about it. If God did all of that to create faith in a person, then all men who believe would be saved because Acts 10, 34 says God's not, not a respecter of persons. So everybody would be saved because God doesn't want anybody lost. And Jesus died for everybody. So if faith is something God just pounces on you <laughs> and works it in your mind some direct, miraculous way, then why wouldn't you do that for everybody? Because he's not a respecter of persons. The Bible clearly teaches that it's the word of God that produces faith. Again, I refer you to what I quoted earlier in verse 31 of John 20. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. You want to see a miracle? Well, I can't show you a miracle. They don't happen anymore. I can read you one. And somebody's going to have to prove that word of God's not true. Are those miracles I read to you in the Bible that confirm the teaching of Christ and confirm him to be the Son of God serve the purpose? John 17, 20, neither pray I for these alone, but them also which shall believe on me through their word. And Acts 15, 7, and when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up, said unto them, men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. All that's in perfect harmony. So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. In Acts 18, 8, And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with his house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Now what did Mark say? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth the gospel and is baptized shall be saved. Is that what happened at, uh, with Christmas, chief ruler of the synagogue? Indeed it did. So we have the command of what to do in preaching the gospel and the belief that's formed by the word of God. And then we see it in action in the book of Acts as people went out in the early church and preached the gospel to people and they heard it and obeyed it. So we're about back to Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the absolute necessity of faith 
is emphasized from the beginning to the end of the Bible. Nobody disputes that. Sometimes in dealing with folks who say that, well, you're saved at the point of faith and no other works are necessary, no other acts of obedience, and um, all that kind of thing. But they don't realize that we accept every verse in the Bible that says we're saved by faith. We accept everything in the Bible that tells us where faith comes from and how it's formed in a person. But we're not contending that salvation is by faith only, which we'll notice more about. Look at the reasons why faith is indispensable to man's salvation from sin. I read in Acts 15, 9, and he put no difference between us and them, Jew and Gentile, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, that's a fact. It's a statement. Our hearts are purified by faith. Now, if you're a denominational person who thinks you're saved by faith only, then you think our hearts are purified by faith only. That's the way you'll read that. But it doesn't say that. It doesn't tell us when faith purifies our hearts. It just tells us faith purifies our hearts. But it tells us the importance of faith, doesn't it? Because our hearts can't be purified if our faith is not right. And we see also in Romans 5.1 that man is justified by faith. People taught that you're saved by faith only. We'll look at that and say, see, you're justified by faith. And in their mind they say only. But it doesn't say that. It simply says that we're justified by faith. And more particularly, since faith is used sometimes to stand for the whole New Testament system, it actually is saying you're justified by the New Testament system and not the Law of Moses system, such as when Jude said, contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. The faith is a synecdoche where a part stands for the whole or whole of the part. And so faith is so important to the Christian system that it's pulled out to stand for the whole New Testament system. So it's not just one's individual belief formed by the Word of God, but the New Testament is a whole system of faith. And if you understand that, you'll understand better a lot of what Paul's reasoning and how he reasons and the words he uses in Romans as he contrasts the system of faith, the New Testament system, with the law of Moses. So may, uh, faith is necessary to salvation. You see that in the conversion of the Philippian jailer in Acts uh, 16, verse 31. You see it in Mark's Great Commission that we've quoted already that belief is necessary. But it's not belief alone. We walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. So when we know the Word of God and we live by the Word of God, we're walking by faith and not by sight. We're going as the Word leads God to direct us. So we can look around us and look like the church is falling in on our heads. The church is going to disappear off the earth. It's going to be persecuted out of this and out of that. But is that the way we're to examine our surroundings and what influences us? No. What we do is look at the Word of God, and we walk as the Word of God leads us and guides us and directs us. Our perspective of things is in the Word of God. We know what's going to happen. Though it may not look like it if you depend solely on the way you observe things around about you. Well, if we were to just simply go on um, <laughs> how things are going on around about us, well, we'd be miserable. But we have God through his word saying, no, here's how it's going to work out. I'm able to control it all. I'll take care of you. You seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, all these things shall be added unto you. May not look like it. May look like the world's caving in on our head. Well, what's the Bible say? That's what we want to learn to look at. That's walking by faith. So the Christian life is to be lived by faith, as Paul told the Galatians in Galatians 2.20. Not as things appear to us. Not as the economy or what's going on in Washington or what some of our brethren do or don't do. No, we go by the perfect law of liberty. Whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. What about that man? Here's a promise from God. This man shall be blessed in his deed. Well, I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't care how he's going to do it. He just said he would do it, and that suits me, James 1.25. And we can't please God, as we've said already, without scriptural faith, Hebrews 11.6. Paul says... And talking about needing authority from the Word of God to be able to act correctly, he says whatsoever is not of faith is sin, Romans 14 and verse 23. In other words, we're to act as we've got up here in Colossians 3, 17. 
uh, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. That means you're doing as the word guides you. And when you do that, then you're operating by faith. But if you can't find any, quote, Bible to authorize you to act, you're not walking by faith. Yeah, but I just feel like God. Well, you can feel like all day long, but if you don't have the Bible authorizing you to act, it's not by faith. Well, I have this good feeling towards so-and-so, and I think so-and-so is such a fine, upstanding person. Blah, 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 blah. Well, are they doing what God told them to do in His Word? Well, no, but they're nice people. They're nice people going to lose their soul because they're not walking by faith. They're walking as they please. And we don't do that. That's not characteristic of the faithful. That's not how you are faithful. Without faith... According to Jesus, to the Jews, we quoted a while ago, we're going to die in our sins, John 8, 24. But I learned from John writing to Christians in 1 John 5, 4, that faith overcomes the world. How does that happen? Well, I just keep trusting what God said. I study it, I write and divide it, I honestly apply it, or I see the need to change to fit it, I fit it, I do it. Well, then, what does that have anything to do with me it overcomes the world and that's the way that we're to live so we can see that every act of obedience and service to God is based upon faith for well, faith comes by hearing hearing by the word of God and that's in complete harmony with Colossians 3 and verse 17 the doctrine then of faith only contradicts the Bible plain and simple it just butts its head into what the Bible says and we've stressed the importance of faith in God's plan of salvation. But people come along and add one little word. One little word. Saved by faith. And what is that word? Only. Isn't it interesting that there was no great treatise and a great book produced when the devil approached Eve and got her to sin? He just used the little word not. One little word. And then people come along and say, yeah, but we're saved by faith. And by that they mean... All by itself. And then what they mean by faith is this. They mean mentally ascending to the fact of a case. Well, that's necessary. But it's not all there is to faith. Faith involves trust and confidence that you'll take him in his word and comply with his will. The mentally ascent that Christ is the Son of God is necessary, but it's not enough. There must be such a faith in him that leads you to take him in his word and comply with his will. Sometimes people talk about, oh, we must have a personal relationship with Jesus. It's that personal relationship with Jesus. Listen to me. There's not a soul on this earth that had as close a personal relationship with Jesus than did Judas Iscariot. Not a soul. Not a soul. Then why wasn't he saved? He had no faith in Jesus. He did not consider him for what he truly was. He did not take him at his word. He had another viewpoint. And thus, while he mentally ascended to the fact that Christ is the Son of God, what good did it do him? He had a personal relationship with him. What good did it do him? It all came back to whether you have a personal relationship with Christ or you're like us. We've never seen him in the flesh. The difference is we take him at his word and we trust him as Lord to keep his commandments and we live by them. Colossians 3.17. That's the difference. So even if you're with Jesus personally, like the apostles were when he was on this earth, you still have to take him at his word and do what he said. And guess what? It was in that earthly ministry that he said, And why call you me Lord, Lord? And do not the things which I say. And they had a personal knowledge of him. They could see what he looked like. They could, see his, they could hear his voice, the sound of his voice. They could see what he looked like when he said things and the way his face looked. I wasn't going to save them. They had to take him at his word and comply from the heart with his will. So this era of salvation by faith only is widespread. It's taught by the majority of the religious world, and it's as easy a way as I know the devil has of causing people to think they're saved and they're not. Now consider these reasons why the doctrine of faith only is false. James 2.17, even so faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. Now I remind you, brethren, that's said to Christians, but it covers all those outside of Christ trying to tell you that you save by faith only. James says that's an impossibility. In James 2.19, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. And you know what I've always said about that. Most people are basing their reason for going to heaven on the devil level of faith. 
That is, the devil knows as well as any of us, if not better, that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. He mentally assents to the fact. Well, he's not saved. He's still the devil. And it's on that idea of faith that the whole denominational world is placing its hope of heaven. The only time faith then is mentioned, faith only is mentioned, faith only is mentioned, is James 2.24. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. I don't know why people can't read that. It's there. It's not hard to understand. In John 12, 42 through 43, there were those who believed, but they would not confess Christ as the Son of God for fear of being put out of the synagogue. Do you think God was happy with them? So here's what happens. And we have a whole chapter dealing with it. Faith has always saved when it was such a trust and belief that it led one to comply with what God commanded them to do. Hebrews 5 and verse 9. Look at very quickly and we'll be through. Hebrews 11 and 4. Watch this. Great given in the New Testament as to how we should use Old Testament examples of faith to teach us how to be faithful. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. There's belief coupled with obedience. And then you look at verse 7. By faith Noah being warned of God not seen as yet, not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark. There it is. Faith and obedience to the commands of God. In verse 8, by faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive a narrative, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. Well, he wouldn't have gone out if he hadn't obeyed. But his obedience was based upon faith, and that faith came by the word of God. And so we look even down to Hebrews 11 in verse um, 9. By faith he, Abraham, sojourned in the land of promise, as in the strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Why did he do all that? God told him to. How did he manifest his belief in God? He sojourned. And then we come down to Hebrews 11 and verse 17. <clears throat> and by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only son. Faith and obedience. Verse 20, by faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Faith and obedience. In verse 21, by faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning upon the top of his staff. Faith and obedience. And then you look at verse 28. Though faith, uh, through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, speaking of Moses, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch him. Faith and obedience. And the last one, verse 30, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. Faith and obedience. If you didn't have anything but Hebrews 11 in the New Testament, you'd have more than what was sufficient to teach that faith is more than mentally ascending to the fact of the matter, but it's a trust in the one, our God, and the Christ to save us through compliance with His will. If that's all you had, Hebrews 11, and all those were in the Old Testament before they ever received the great promises of the New Testament. Faith then is a work of man, and it's a work we must do. It is obedience. And you can see that in John uh, 6, 28 through 29. Then said they unto him, What shall we do, that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. So even the belief that forms in us upon our reception of the evidence that comes from the word of God is a work. Now whose work is it? It's the work of God. Anytime we know the truth and comply with the truth regarding what God says we ought to do, you know whose work's being done? God's work's being done. When you are baptized into Christ, whose work's being done? Who's cleansing you of your sins? God is. It's a passive thing on our part. We simply comply with the Lord's will. We submit to His will. And in effect, when we submit to His will, Jesus is baptizing us into Himself. There's no way that the work of Christ is done on this earth when the Lord's spiritual body made up of members in particular don't do it. Is the gospel going to be preached by anyone else but faithful members of the church? No. Who was commissioned of Christ to preach the gospel to every creature? Christ preached the church. He said, do it. It's our job. And yet God would have everybody be saved. 
So the church is an integral, special relationship with God and the salvation of souls. Because God's not going to come down here directly and preach the gospel to every creature. He does it through us, members of his church who are faithful to his call. And when people hear the message and humbly believe it and obey it, their faith makes them whole. If you're not a Christian today, we've learned what the Bible teaches about the importance of faith, the falsity of faith only saving anybody, and that faith plus obedience to the gospel of Christ saves one from past sins, and the Lord adds him to the church. Just read Acts 2 when the church started. As a child of God now, a lot of these things are written to members of the church. Are we faithful in the church? Are we putting into practice those things God says Christians are to do to be faithful? So if we haven't been doing that, then we need to repent. Confess those faults and pray God for forgiveness. You're subject to the good gospel of Christ. The invitation of the Lord is extended to you while we stand and sing.